your firm can only get better if your fellow collaborators and partners get better. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Hiroshi Okamoto, who is one of the co-founders of OLI Architecture. So Hiroshi is a member of the AIA and has had an exciting architectural career path working at practices such as the Yoshida Finley Partnership in Japan and with the joint venture of Nikken Sekei, Tahata Gumi and RTKL International on Tokyo infrastructure projects. And of course, Hiroshi worked very closely with the late I.M. Pei in the twilight of his career, working on such fabulous projects as the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha from 2001 to 2008, where he was a contract administrator. And then he was the project architect of the chapel at the Mihu Institute of Aesthetics from 2008 to 2012 in Shigaraki in Japan, which was I.M. Pei's final project. In 2010, Hiroshi and his co-founder Bing Lin uh, founded OLI Architecture and Hiroshi has been the design principal on project architect projects such as the Muxin Art Museum, the Chengdu Silk Art Culture Museum and the Museum and the Museum of Islamic Art Renovation in Doha, Qatar to name just a few and the firm has also won a number of prestigious awards and recognitions. In this episode, we discuss Hiroshi's career and the business lessons learned from masters like I am Pei. We discuss how the firm used relationships they had developed in the art world to grow a firm. And we discuss working internationally and understanding different business cultures. So sit back, relax and enjoy Hiroshi Okamoto. Hey, Enix Sears here from Business of Architecture. And if you run an architectural practice, then probably one of the most difficult parts about running your practice is making sure you get your fees right, getting the right fee for the job. Because if you undercharge, ultimately, as you know, what ends up happening is you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left. In that case, you're juggling to try to rob Peter to pay Paul, stealing from a more profitable project to support the less profitable projects. And on the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients absorbently too much than you actually need to get the project done. So the question is, how do you charge the right fee? Well, one resource that's been lacking in the architecture industry for a long time now is some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. If you try to run a Google search on it, what do architects charge, you'll find some outdated information that's wildly inaccurate. And so I just want to record this quick little video to let you know and get to so you can look forward to something that we're doing here at Business of Architecture, which is we will be launching a comprehensive fee report talking about and just revealing what architectural practices around the United States and elsewhere are actually charging, how they set their fees. Do they do percentage of construction costs? Is it stipulated sum? Is it hourly not to exceed? Also, what are the particular amounts? We're really excited about this because ever since we started, uh, founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been a common question is like, is my pricing right? Is my pricing right? And so this is the question that we hope to answer when we release in December, we'll be releasing uh, this fee report. Now, one of the advantages is of us as a consulting agency is that we can put out this kind of information. Unfortunately, as you know, if you're in the United States, a couple decades ago, the AIA got into big trouble because they published a list of basically like a fee chart, right? So like a fee matrix. And then the United States Justice Department decided that that was price fixing. It was it was causing a monopoly. And so they got in big trouble for doing that. Well, fortunately, from our perspective, we're not limited to talk about fees because we're not an organization. We're not a membership organization. We don't represent architecture as a whole. We're simply a consultancy. And as a matter of fact, our job and our business is to help architectural practices to succeed. So this is why we're super excited about this. So this is just a heads up. Make sure you keep your eyes out on your inbox. If you're not already on our email list, head over to businessofarchitecture.com. Make sure you sign up for our free live video training, and then you'll automatically get put onto our email list. So you will be the first to be notified when we release the fee and compensation report. All right. This is specifically tailored for you. If you're a small architectural practice owner, you'll get to see very clearly what other people of similar size firms, similar size demographics, similar typologies are actually charging, how they set their fees. So you can start to answer that big question is, I wonder how I fit into what my competitors are charging. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice. 
practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hiroshi, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. So you're the founder of OLI Architecture based in New York. You've worked with IM Pay um, on a number of really significant projects and I've had a, a lot of experience working in, in that office. And you were also working with Yoshida Findlay um, yes, yes. back in the late 90s. Yes, in Japan. In Japan. Yes. Yeah. which was quite quite amazing. And I was saying to you earlier, that was, um, you know, I saw Catherine speak at the Bartlett maybe 2000, the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at yeah. that point, they already had quite an incredible, you know, portfolio of work, the Trust House, the Soft and Hairy House. And yes. it was work that, like you were saying, it was kind of ahead of its time almost. I, I, it was really, and um, I went to work with them after my undergraduate work, and I graduated in '92 from Cornell University, and went to Japan, and um, I first worked on a larger uh, government project with um, Niken Seke, and it was a joint venture, so it was a very big project. Um, and then I sought them out. I used to actually intern for Arata Isazaki during the summers when I was in school. And that's where I first met, uh, Mr. Ishida and Catherine, actually, she was working there mm. and, and they had, um, uh, they were married and they had plans to start their own business and they had started it. And, um, I had known them for a little bit and I went to work for them about 95, 96. Yeah. For two and a half years. Um, and it's some, something, uh, you know, I cherish the experience. It was a little bit sad towards the end. Um, yes. they were doing these amazing projects that were ahead of their time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Japan was going through kind of, uh, neo-modernism. I would say. And yeah. um, as you know, Catherine is this voice, voiceless, um, outgoing personality, totally creative, unbelievable um, person in person, and very kind as well, and very warm hearted. Um, and her husband, um, Eisaku Ushida, he was an amazing technical architect. He was like, he's like his right hand man. Right. And uh, unfortunately, he was taciturn, totally the opposite, the polar opposite of uh, <laughs> Catherine, which doesn't, you know, doesn't surprise you many times when you see different different couples. But um, they were a great match and a great team. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. Japan was still, you know, it's still a xenophobic, misogynist society in certain <laughs> ways. Yeah. And uh, she was butting up against uh, a hard ceiling, mm-hmm. not even a glass ceiling. And um, they had early success with these amazing houses, uh, the Trustwell House, you said, the Soft and Hairy House. Um, but their style um, was just not something that was prevalent then, mm-hmm. and which would become more and more so later. I, me- I remember uh, Future Systems, uh, yes. that Amanda Levitt, they would write to them, they were good friends, I guess, and they would they would praise their projects and they would talk about how they can successfully launch their firms and get better projects. But unfortunately, all that creative talent I saw wasted in a way because um, the husband, he was an amazing architect. I learned a lot about um, how to put things together, Mm -hmm. how to draw, but he would never be out there pushing the practice. So around five o'clock, that was it. And then he would kind of, retreat into his own domain and Mm -hmm. have a drink and enjoy his own thing. And so um, I, that was a big lesson for me. Um, Amazing talent. Um, Also talent doesn't get you every, I mean, talent in terms of architecture and um, designing, but being an architect requires many talents. And part of it is of course, um, client relationships, selling yourself, 
and your brand and your vision. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. Being, yeah. being able to win the work. We're, we're kind yes. of fed the illusion, if you like, at university that talent is enough uh, on its own. Uh, yeah. And there is this whole plethora of other skills and communication um, talents that are needed in yeah. order to be able to keep a practice and, alive. And Ryan, you know, we see, I see this over and over again. So I've been working, I have my own firm for 12 years with my partner. We've um, hired quite a few people. We're about 30 people, 31, um, 31 right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it fluctuates, but it's been fluctuating in an upward trend for the last 10 years, 12 years. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think the schools and, I'm, you know, I can't talk for the schools in the UK. I know Bartlett A a little bit, um, but uh, they don't really prepare you for the practice, I think. Yeah. And they prepare you for the critical thinking and problem solving and thinking about architecture and some architectural history and engineering. But they don't really tell you about the business of architecture and how to run a successful firm and how to how to be um, a practicing professional. I guess. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so your experience of I am pay, one would consider him to have have kind of balanced both domains well so being yes. able to produce extraordinary architecture and incredible buildings and have a commercial sensibility about the work that he was doing and being able to win work what were some of the lessons that you learned about running a business from IMP? Uh, you know there was the IMP school and there are many graduates but um <laughs> It was an amazing experience. Uh, my partner and I um, worked for him for about uh, from I worked. I started working with him in 2000. And this is when he had re- kind of retired from his partnership. He was still helping out his old firm on projects that were kind of legacy projects or projects that were ongoing, like the Luxembourg Modern Art Museum, which is a Mudan Museum, the Deutsch Historisch Museum. There was an Athens Contemporary Art Museum that I was first put on, which was for the Galandris family. Um, and then subsequent to that, after certain failures of that project, running into artifacts during construction and stops and uh, starts and stops, I was working on the Museum of Islamic Art Forum in Doha. And so I, and I, I think for myself and my partner, we're lucky to be in a position in his career, I am Pei's career, it was tight in the twilight of his career. He was picking and choosing amazing signature projects, having a lot of fun, um, but also we were able to see him in action with the clients and um, knowing, sometimes knowing what the client wanted before the client wanted to know, mm-hmm. know about it or um, really just being able to put people in a certain position, um, always having that sense of who's needed and why at the right time. And um, the practice we saw, it wasn't really about the design so much that attracted us to IM and his practice, but it was really um, this kind of consummate professional architect that we saw that um, he, he demanded... Uh, the design excellence, but the execution and the kind of client relations to uh, working with consultants or fabricators or contractors, even end users, because usually a lot of these larger projects would have multiple end users and stakeholders. Yeah. Um, just navigating those the politics of that was something that we learned and it, we cut our teeth working for him. Um, you know, there there weren't there wasn't a lack of people wanting to work with them, but um, it was very competitive. But um, somehow he took us under his wings um, and really kind of showed us how things were done in a way, and gave us the responsibility to fail as well. So yeah, how um, long but were, that how, that's the trust as well, I guess. How, how long were you there in total? So I worked from 2000 to 2008. Um, I was uh, mainly on the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, and I um, I was a site representative and uh, represented him on site and then um, kind of living on and off in Doha. At that time in Doha, in Qatar, mm-hmm. uh, there wasn't a, 
uh, robust infrastructure for construction. So I would be traveling around uh, Europe, Dubai, even Japan for certain um, parts and fabricators and specialty um, finishes. Uh, and then after that, I actually worked um, as an independent uh, design consultant for the Museum Islamic Art Park which uh, we started with IM, but when we finished the museum, he was already 92. And he had um, kind of stepped down from the role of design, actively designing. And uh, it was when we, at the end of our museum, he commissioned or the the client asked him who he wanted to have for um, uh, a special commission art piece, site specific. it was his choice to have Richard Serra there. And that's where I helped out working with Richard Serra. And from that point on, we've had a good relationship with him working on several projects. Um, but that was 2008 to 2012. And then also he was asked after Doha from the Miho Art Museum, uh, Miho Museum uh, client, which is in Kyoto, um, to work on a school for him for them, which is the uh, Miho Institute of Aesthetics. And at that time, he had declined several times. And this Mm -hmm. is, he usually declines commissions. I've seen it over and over again, where um, he would never say yes, he would never say no. (laughs) Um, But uh, he would kind of, it would be a dance. And, you know, at, at the time that I met him, he already had that reputation. And so he commanded a certain amount of respect and people would come to him. Yeah. But, um, you know, even working, I, I guess, the commission for the Museum of Islamic Art, it was actually first a competition that um, Charles Korea and there was a um, Palestinian architect won. And then that project kind of um, uh, idled for a little bit and then they approached IM. And he said, um, I'll think about it. Let me take some time to study. Mm-hmm. And uh, he traveled around um, through uh, Algeria and Egypt. He had worked in Kuwait earlier in his life as well, but um, he kind of uh, took time to study as well as to back channel through um, the clients to make sure that this was a real project and understanding the nature of the project and what they wanted, which was a signature museum that really put um, the cultural kind of significance of a whole country mm-hmm. um, on a project. So, yeah. and, and as, as pay began to decline, was the thinking in the office that the office would naturally wind down or they wanted to continue on with, cause it was pay cob and free, sure. wasn't it? Yeah, it was pay cob free, but it's a little complicated um, because at, when I met him, he had already, um, uh, retired from his partnership and he was helping out just on a few projects that were the legacy projects. I see. And he had an office space in the same building, but on a different floor. And then he would also, he has two sons. Uh, he had three sons. One, the eldest one passed away, unfortunately. Um, the two sons are architects and he had um, them being executing architects for his Sujo Art Museum. I see. And then he had on his own as IMP architect worked on the uh, Museum of Islamic Art. So he had a smaller team. I think that's why we were able to get close to him. Um, oh, wow. Probably during his heyday, you know, it was 200 plus, 230 plus people. Yeah. You know. um, and mostly partners would be the only ones talking to him. Um, but when we were working with him, um it was maybe 20 15 to 20 close people really yeah amazing so that's a really intimate working relationship yeah. and you know we knew you know as we saw his projects and he was getting older and especially at the end of doha it was it was already we could see that he was slowing down a bit mm-hmm. and he took on the miho institute of art uh, commission as just the master planner which I, I helped on, and then he did a chapel. And the chapel is at the heart of this institute, um, literally in the middle of the campus. And um, as if you 
um, most of your listeners or some of your listeners may know, he first did a, early on in his career, did a chapel in Taiwan called the Loose Chapel. And it's this beautiful hyperbolic shell, uh, four hyperbolic shells tiled in this golden yellow tile um, with a curtain wall in the, in the middle. You kind of like a and, scarf, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a beautiful project. And um, he, you know, he kept saying, I started with a chapel, I'm going to end with a chapel. And this time he made a stainless steel chapel. It was kind of in a tear-shaped um, geometry, like a, mm, what we call, I guess, a lemnus gate. So it was like a lofted tear, tear shape onto a smaller lofted tear shape. And uh, it was a very complex geometry. There was no single parallel line to it because of the offsets. Um, it was a ruled surface. Um, but after he first started thinking about it and he started cutting paper in in his bed um, with scissors, his wife would complain. He was a night owl. <laughs> his wife, wife would complain all the time. And he was cutting this paper and he took a fan shape. If you take like unroll a fan, um, and actually cut a fan shape out and then actually pin the top part or the bottom part. Yeah. Get this almost like a, a shirt collar. And that was the shape of the chapel. And he kept playing with the geometry. And that after that, he it was almost like he knew that it was going to be OK. He asked me to take care of the project. And um, after about a year, he kind of, it was a four year project. After about a year, he um, really declined. And I would come, you know, I would go to his house to report about the project, but it was something that um, uh, unfortunately uh, uh, had to be finished without him. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. and, and so you and, and Bing decided yes. to set up OLI around about 2010? Yes. So there's so a bit of overlap. 12 years. Yes. Got it. Okay. So there's a bit of overlap here. And also yeah, you're so, setting, setting up a practice in the middle of, well, coming the tail end of the recession. Yeah. And the recession, you know, the layman shock we call it in Japan, but the recession, uh, I guess in some ways we were not as impacted. We we're maybe um, too naive to be scared. I don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, But also, uh, we just came from this amazing experience working with IMP, you know, uh, on and off for about 12, 13, 14 years. And uh, the confidence of working with these clients, the, you know, Sheikh Amaeso, the Emir of Qatar or Sheikh Saud at the beginning, or the Koyamas and really taking care of the projects. um, We cut our teeth on some of these significant projects. So, we knew we could do it. We just needed to find out, figure out how to go about finding clients and commissions and getting the building up a portfolio and the trust to get um, these types of commissions. And mm-hmm. so um, the other thing I would say for those young aspiring architects or architects who are looking to start their own firm, you have to have a day job first or a commission <laughs> and maybe five commissions that you're working on because the first one may be okay. Hopefully it survives and you finish, mm-hmm. but it's always the next and the next one. So our part of our practice is really developing projects as, as of anyone's practice, I would think. And some so, projects take four or five years to develop. So, so in, in the beginning there, how were you, what were the, the, the initial projects that you're winning and how are you, how are you winning them? Was it sure. through competitions sure. or? No. Um, and that was another thing. We do competitions now a little bit, um, but usually this is like a middle industry secret. You try to leverage your uh, relationship, back channel, know what's going on. And we would only yeah. enter a competition if we really thought we had some sort of a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, I think we learned from I am also, it's like, I never do comp- competitions. It's usually not as transparent as you think. And there's politics <laughs> involved, but it's also just a lot of time and effort, you know, yes. and, um but we do sometimes but um well, it's a, a, lot, calculated. A, a, a lot of a lot of wisdom right there what you've just said about this yeah. it, it's it's really not as transparent as we think as we think it's it is. not because we you know i don't want to say it but there are times when we're asked our opinion to help commission uh competition organizers you know and, mm-hmm. and, and so 
um, I guess working in this industry for 25, 30 years now, um, you kind of see a lot, you know, and um, I still uh, have my eyes out and we kind of look at competitions that are on the board, but we rarely enter them. But the way we started was um, with IMP, we worked on uh, projects with significant artists. You know, in his early years, he worked with like in the National Gallery with Moore and Calder. He worked with Picasso, um, wow. the UN, uh, the um, NYU dorms. Um, and so my partner, Bing, was working on the embassy in uh, Washington, D.C., for uh, the Chinese embassy. It was a new building, new wing. And uh, essentially, he um, had commissioned all these young uh, contemporary artists from China uh, to work in the building. And mm -hmm. he would always promote art and the architecture. So a certain amount of uh, the commission, he would always try to convince the client and also certain government regulations required it. But uh, so art was integral and uh, site specific or commission art was necessary. And, and so we met these artists who were these amazing contemporary artists from China who were just kind of getting very famous and popular. And uh, through them, we were invited to um, we're introduced to another project in China, in Suzhou, which was a silk embroidery art museum. Um, and it's a UNESCO site. I don't know if everyone, uh, your uh, it, read, uh, listeners from that. Yeah. This is the North Zone yeah. Silk Factory. No, this is the uh, it's silk embroidery art museum in Suzhou. And in Suzhou, um, there is, a, if your listeners know, it's actually a um, a canal town that's very famous, very traditional. Uh, it has seven UNESCO sites. It's, um, you know, it has a very long history. It's a, a old um, city. The, o the older inner city is uh, surrounded by a moat. And it was an area where a lot of literati scholars would retire into and build their secret gardens mm -hmm. and write poetry and calligraphy and such. So we were uh, commissioned to work on a, a um, embroidery museum, which um, if you know about silk embroidery, there it's folk art, um, it's right. craft art. And there's four schools in China, uh, the Hangzhou School, the Guangdong School, um, uh, and Suzhou was one of the, the most famous one, the most delicate one. And they would, they would have a working art museum. And the uh, investor client was the one who um, had bought into the institute that would make this silk embroidery. But um, in for the rights to buy the actual property, he actually promised to build a museum there. And that's how we were introduced through, um, through some of our artist friends. Actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so is, and is this a, a, a kind of method or strategy that you continue to use today in order to win work is just kind of maintaining relationships or. Oh, oh is... yeah. I mean, I think um, it's an active strategy for I would, I would hope, or I would think, especially in our, in our office, but um, in any practice, mm -hmm. um, like I said, like winning commissions, you always are out there developing uh, projects, um, meeting people. Uh, um, you know, it's usually uh, what happened to us was uh, subsequent to that project, we worked on another project for a single artist in China um, who was the kind of the mentor of all these contemporary artists who used, they all used to live in New York. They were right. like the diaspora of um, this kind of young generation of artists. In the 80s, they had fled China, moved to New York. Um, and so their teacher was named, his name was Mu Sheng. <coughs> Mu Sheng. And he was the one who mentored them in the history of Western and Asian art and uh, philosophy and popular culture and literature. And when uh, these 
artists, contemporary artists, um, moved back to uh, China during the economic booms of the late 90s and 2000. Uh, they wanted to celebrate uh, Mushin, their teacher's life. And so they had um, sought out a museum in his hometown, uh, befriending the, um, the client who was the tourism industry of this town called Wujian, which is another beautiful canal town. Right. And we were, we were invited to meet Mushing and we were invited to pitch a project. Mm -hmm. And so that also was a direct relationship with these artists. Um, but, you know, as I was saying, even working in Doha, uh, subsequent to that, we actually had a commission to work on the museum again, renovating the fifth floor, uh, doing a terrace. And also Alan Ducasse has a restaurant there. So we helped modify certain elements of the architecture. And then again, with the commission with Richard Serra that I worked on the park, I was invited maybe uh, early 2015, I get a call from the Gagosian Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, they're asking for a portfolio and we sent the portfolio. It was kind of, they were saying, oh, there's a significant collector who's looking to um, commission uh, a piece to house a um, significant piece of art. And so we sent the portfolio out and we had, we didn't hear back for maybe a year or so. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we get another call and um, they're saying that they want to actually hire us. And so I had inquired who was the person who made that introduction. It was Richard Serra. And the collector <laughs> was a preeminent collector, one of the preeminent contemporary art collectors in America. Amazing. Um, and we did the London Cross Pavilion for him. And that that sculpture was first shown in London, actually at the Google. Well, Center. that that's an extraordinary yeah. um, project. A yes. beautiful, beautiful, beautiful project. Thank you. Thank you. Very small. Um, took a long time, though. It was, we finished in two thousand, so that was a five year project. So, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so so these relationships that go very deep and have been, you know, very um, pivotal in being able to bring in more work to the practice yes. yeah uh, and the, my, my next question would be obviously there's a lot of work that you've been doing which is international yes and your main i know that you've got offices in shanghai paris and in new york obviously yes um, the paris uh, office is kind of shut down for now since covid but, right okay yeah. and and so working in a place like china Yes. Obviously, you, you would have had a bit of experience at, at, with Iron Pay, but yes, that, this is this is not for the faint-hearted. No, it's not. It's could, you definitely a, not. could you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges and how you how you have to set up an office? And, and I understand yeah. that, I understand that there's a, there's some interesting things, kind of similar to what happens in the Middle East, where if you're setting up a business in China, then the part of it needs to be owned by the state. Is that correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, it depends on the type of practice that you right. run. Um, so I, I, a little background, I think working in the Middle East and um, with IMP, but also mm -hmm. on my own and in our practice, as well as in Japan. Um, and then we also had, uh, on our own, we worked with our client, um, a big, uh, um, consumer goods company, uh, in Japan, um, and working in the States and working in China, like all the clients are different. Of course, you know, the, the culture and the culture of construction, um, is quite different, uh, in every in any of these countries um but there is a common thread sometimes um but the challenges are pretty big in china but the possibilities are very big as well so yeah. i would say and i used to say this i don't say this that much anymore um in china uh everything is difficult but anything is possible <laughs> uh so and Actually, it's amazing now because we started in 2010 and I think we were in a good place where we wrote also this cultural um, boom 
um, an architectural boom, I think, and a design boom, in a sense. The appreciation for and the design talent now is so much better than 10 years ago, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, but then again, you get this kind of politi political discourse about, the, I guess, uh, the trend of what's happening and also COVID and the zero zero COVID policy. Yeah. Um, I was on a plane before COVID. I was on a plane once every two to three weeks traveling to Asia. And there were times when we had a project in the Middle East, in Tokyo, in China. And so we, I would just fly around the world once a month. Wow. Um, and so... It was quite taxing. And, you know, I had a young daughter and my wife, which is amazing support. Yeah. Um, but as our firm grew, and this is good timing because this is COVID was what, 2020, 2019 and yeah. 2020. Um, I was tired of traveling. I had kind of pared back a little bit. And mm -hmm. also our office started to mature a little more. So we're at like a 3.0. So 1.0, we're just running around totally energetic, crazy working weekends, late nights, you know, whatever it um, takes, whatever it took. And, 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 you know, I, it, we're lucky you don't get a museum commission as your first commission. So yeah. Or a second commission that became reality. But um, so we were going crazy, but um, at 2.0, we realized we couldn't sustain it. And also we we're burning people out and ourselves out. And at 3.0, um, we were we were good and we were lucky enough and no one teaches you in school how to run a business and how to run a practice and how to be the hr person and the cheerleader and the psychologist <laughs> and um and the finance guy and everything but uh we're lucky to groom and have amazing people and you quickly realize the best thing about a practice are the people who work in the practice and the, the collaborators and your your employees or mm -hmm. your your partners in, in this kind of um, profession. And so um, we try to retain uh, as much as possible the top people. And they are, you know, we have a few that are still with us and have grown. And yep. um, that's the secret, really. Uh, Amazing. And, yeah. and, and as the practice has kind of grown from, from you and, and being now into, how many did you say it was a team across 30? 30? 31. Yeah. 31. It, it fluctuates here and there, but um, it kind of, it's like a, a sponge, but it gets bigger, I guess. So it kind of grows, it goes back, grows, goes back, but um, in a way, keeps getting a little bigger every time it grows back. So, yeah. What, what, what have been some of the things that have allowed you to sustain business growth and to kind of, you know, move from those iterations of 1.0, 2.0? Sure. So, certain yeah. systems that you had to put into place or things around finance that had to be in control? Uh, personal growth, yes. Finance, um I guess, uh, I mean, this is a topic we could talk for hours. <laughs> um, not not only finance, just the sustaining the business. And um, we we're talking before, uh, a little bit before we came on, about how schools really don't prepare you for the profession in terms yes. of how to run a business. And they teach you critical thinking and, you know, architectural history a little and engineering and design philosophy and problem solving. But um, and the problem solving part is an amazing thing because that's part of, you know, that's business. Yeah. Um, but, you know, understanding finances, billing. But I think um it's hard for me to say this probably because it sounds a little naive, but uh, we had the fortune of having some big projects at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then we had the fortune of this kind of ethos, like this passion that everyone bought into. Yeah. And so we've always had good talent and we, we would burn some people out. And unfortunately we couldn't keep some people we wanted to keep. Yes, uh, but we learned ourselves that we had to evolve and get better. So at this moment, we don't work weekends, hardly work late into the night. 
Um, you know, when there are deadlines, there are deadlines. We work hard, but we work more efficiently. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there are points in, you know, COVID was a little hard at the beginning. Um, there are times when we were, you know, um, uh, shrinking and then I had to sustain the office by putting my own savings in once in a while, things mm -hmm. like that. And those things happen, you know, especially when you're smaller. Yeah. And yeah. sustaining the office. But we always had um, project development and projects coming in. And we always had one or two running projects always going, which we were lucky with. And the naive part, I guess, was that um, we didn't tailor our practice and our, our the type of projects we wanted mm -hmm. and the type of projects we wanted to work because of the economy. Right. So you've always had a uh, kind of quite a diverse portfolio. Yeah. But also the thinking of how to work, uh, how to make a project. We never try to regurgitate form or ideas. We always look at each individual project for what it wants to be. We think about the site very much, um, the context, the culture of construction. And then we try to leverage kind of our technical and kind of um, I guess the professional knowledge, mm -hmm. we're pretty nimble still. We're not this huge behemoth. Yes. So we leverage that into pushing certain designs and um, certain um, technical challenges and political challenges. And we push it a little further than most firms can probably by being able to navigate things that we've seen before or we can predict. And, um, and so the part that um, I wanted to emphasize is like, we, you know, we sometimes decline projects. Um, we rarely do, but we usually are careful with the clients, like the type of clients and the type of projects they're looking for. Um, if it's not a right fit, it's not a right fit. Um, we usually make an offer that they should refuse if that happens. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. Uh, and usually it does because, you know, the type of clients that we know we don't want to work with are the ones that aren't aligned in the goals that mm. we want for their project. Um, and so, um, did, but did... it served us well, this philosophy, because, you know, we're still here, knock on wood, getting bigger. I think, you know, we've had repeat clients. We're working with Richard Sarah on, a, on another project right now for a different client. Um, and so it, it kind of grows, um, but it also kind of reinforces that what we've been doing has been, um, has been fulfilling as well mm -hmm. as, um, well received in certain ways. Yeah. You, you mentioned there that personal growth was another big part of this. What, how has your leadership changed or your role of leadership both with you and being how has that evolved and changed over the last 12 years and what and what kind of growth have you had if you had to do because it's that's you know that's something that we're again we're not taught at architecture school is you know you're the leader you're you're the one that's going to be taking the responsibility yeah. if, if people I, I i struggle with it every day still yeah um because um i learned that you know Early on, you learn that you can't do this by yourself. Mm -hmm. No one, you know, I hate when architects are like, I designed that. Or, you know, even a firm won't, you know, a building is built because of the confluence of all these entities and interests coming together to create this beautiful artifact for some reason, you know. And uh, we're just part of that process, you know, and we give a design intent. And we, we kind of take on the client's uh, interests program and um, goals and we interpret that as a design mm. um, but um, I think you know it's just the growth part is that knowing that um, even if I could do it better myself I need to help other people learn because you can't scale yourself yes I'm only one person and we're only one firm and so how do you meet efficiency without diluting your effect mm. and that means that you have to know 
how to, um, you know, you have to know how to plug talent in in certain areas and at certain times. You have to know how to read uh, the team um, and the strengths and weaknesses. You have to know how to read the client. Um, and then knowing that you can't do it all by yourself and knowing that you, if you want to get bigger and you want to get better, you need to support your support other people who can help you get bigger and better because they'll get better. And your firm can only get better if um, your fellow collaborators and partners get better. So that's one of the biggest things. And I still struggle with it because there are times when, you know, it's not an easy profession and yeah. there are deadlines or there's a lot of pressure on this or things aren't working out. And we never have this kind of pencils down moment, which is terrible too, because we burn we burn a lot of our fees trying to perfect things. Yes. Um, and uh, it's a little bit something that I'm trying to correct, but we always push to the point of our own, I don't want to say our own satisfaction, but what we feel is right for the project. And sometimes it's more than what the client wants or anticipates. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's your job also to argue or not argue, but to show the client something that they don't realize or they don't, because they hire you for your opinion, your professional service, right? Your, your talent and your knowledge. And so if the client knew everything, they should be able to do it themselves. But, you know, as a, as an architectural professional, you have your own set of tools and values and knowledge that you can impart and have an impact on the, the project. And so um, growing, knowing when to plug people in in certain times and knowing when to stay away or out of the process, we're a pretty horizontal firm. There's no top-down mandate on this is the design or this is the way it is. And I'm not sketching all the time, handing out things, but I try to guide as much as possible without a heavy hand. Yeah. And um, I very much believe in collaboration. Um, so, you, you, you mentioned there that one of the kind of struggles that you've had in the practice is, you know, when, when to put the pens down. And this is something, yeah. you know, the, every architect I've spoken to, there's, we're always fighting this balance between wanting to do something beautiful, wanting to, to make it the best possible design, and yes. then, but eating through the fees at the same time. Yes. How have you kind of started to navigate that challenge or what sorts of tools or processes have you put in place to, to get better at, do, at, at that kind of achieving that balance? Sure. So um, I guess on the technical side, I'm very much a believer in tools, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily for as an end game or, you know, as a small firm, we, um, we hire people with talent, not necessarily with experience, although we've learned also um, we need a good mix, but you know, there's different philosophies around this, but like some people, some of my friends who have their own offices are like, I never hire anyone straight out of school. I only hire people with three or four years of experience. You know, yeah. I don't want to train people and then they go away, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes the person out of school are very adept at the tools that you're looking to use or utilize mm -hmm. much more than the three year person who's kind of, had their own experience, which is great, but um, may not have those other tools that you may want to exploit. So, uh, um, you know, so we're very much, if we need it, we'll buy it, software or, you know, prototyping machines, laser cutters. Um, but, um, you know, so any software package from most people in our office were, 3D heavy and Rhino and Revit, but we, you know, we go through Grasshopper and Dynamo and um, not so much coding. You can do a little Python um, processing, but also, you know, Climate Studio or any tool that we need to learn or want to learn. If we have the opportunity to utilize it, um, we try to incorporate it in some way. And it's not so efficient at the beginning, but we have a lot of people who are pretty proficient about picking up tools pretty quickly. Yeah. So that's definitely the efficiency part is amazing. Like the Revit, it has a downside in the, um, I think it's very, 
intensive at the beginning in terms of the the work that's put in to model and embed the information, um, making families, uh, custom libraries, uh, adaptive families, but the utilization of it as a documentation tool and then now studying, you know, their plugins where rendering uh, like Enscape, real-time plugins and things like that. But it's, um, and structural analysis as well. Uh, but, you know, we worked on certain huge projects, uh, like a large, a very large kindergarten in China. It's like 39, mm. 39, I think 39 buildings. They're all in individually discrete volumes. Oh, wow. n- not the same. And that was a team at the height of that team was maybe seven people. Wow. And it was, you know, one of our senior people um that's been with us for a long time and she handled that whole project and they transitioned to revit in that project they're the ones who are saying if we're going to do this project we have to do it on revit we have to learn revit and i you know it was a decision we had to make and revit's not cheap either but um you know we transitioned and now every project that we're working out of our office in new york is in revit so yeah and in and is so there that, that's the tool like, part yeah got Sorry, it go and, and in yeah. terms of like monitoring fees and finance within the business yes how, how have you evolved with those sorts of systems uh not as robust as we want um we have you know our bookkeeper here we have a bookkeeper in shanghai mm. i but still i'll look through everything um my partner as well um we have a good right now we have a few projects that are very good commissions that are um bringing in substantial fees um but uh i would say um it was more of a global aspect instead of kind of a um um i would say accounting or um, day-to-day kind of, um, uh, how do I say, implementation of uh, financial structure. And so, you know, the commission and commission for architects and depends on the type of practice you have, but our practice, we have very long-term large projects. Yes. So our fees are on deliverables usually. And um, we're usually on a fixed fee and then uh, on a hourly basis if there's a um, ad service. And so our fixed fees would be on the end of the uh, phases. Like, um, I guess in the UK, you have what, uh, schematic design or preliminary design, which we call design development, Yep. And construction documentation, and then construction administration. And for us, from the beginning of our practice, we always ask for site representation to be commissioned to have someone on site full time. Not everyone agrees, but a lot of our uh, clients agree. And so we spread the fees over these areas. And it's easy for clients as well, because they know that, you know, their fee thresholds. So it's not like a one time commitment. Mm -hmm. Um, But also when we have these large projects, like we're working with Diageo, which is like a UK beverage company right now. Right. Uh, you know, and it will be like we put in an invoice and their their turnaround is like 120 days or 90 days. You know, it's crazy. We have to wait for that time. But we know exactly when it's coming in because on that day it comes in. You know, but um, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, we figured out ways to project on um, the kind of more monthly, quarterly income coming in because we get chunks of fees coming in at a time instead of small fees here and there uh, on smaller projects. We do have smaller projects, um, but by far, usually the larger projects will help offset any inconsistencies or losses or inefficiencies that we need or, or disruptions. So, yeah. Got it. And in, and in terms of the, partnership with with you and Bing what's what what's been the key there of keeping that working how have you guys what sorts of challenges have you had 
What's mm. the key to having a, a an effective partnership? Um, I guess uh, I would say a few things. We we both have um, varying talents, um, and we had a relationship before, and our experience with IMP was something that probably was the genesis and also the backbone of what we're doing. Um, we both experienced something that not a whole lot of people would experience working on these kind of signature, high profile, high pressure projects. Yeah. Um, and so we, we sought that out because I think we both wanted to do something like that as professionals in our own firm. And so when, after, as I was saying, it was, um, I am was winding down his practice. We're like, okay, what are we going to do? And um, we were talking about our different projects and we were actually um, what we call butt mates, I guess. We were sitting in the same kind of cubicle area <laughs> back to back. So we we're friends anyway. So right. we had kind of a personal relationship. But um, besides that, I think we had varying talents, which was also key. Um, so we started out, I mean, our office headquarters, everything is in New York. And as you talked about our office in China, what happens, I'm, I'm myself brought up in Japan, grown in, um, born in Japan, grew up mostly in the U.S. And then I went back to Japan after college before graduate school. Right. And Bing was brought, uh, born in Shanghai, went through high school in Shanghai, in the middle of Shanghai, and then came to the States, went to Washington State and then Columbia and lived in the States and worked for a few companies in the States before joining IM. So we both had some similar backgrounds. Also, his family, his father had worked with Japan, actually, uh, in his own business. And my father had, is a, in textiles. He has his own business and had some factories in China as well. So oh, wow. it was kind of a common element and thread there. Yeah. Um, and then I would say um, also in terms of what we bring, I think, you know, we can, we have layers of, I don't want to say layers, we have certain kind of middle management and senior people and we would have meetings and sometimes we would not be in the same meeting anymore because, you know, we're quite busy and a little bit larger. So I would hear from the project manager or others, and they would be in a meeting with Bing, and I can already understand what he's thinking before they tell me, because they're just giving me an outline <laughs> of the project. And probably 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm like, correct. And they were in the meeting talking to him, but I know more than they, they do, what he, <laughs> you know, what the project's about, just from the outline of what it is. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's... Um, the 10, 12 years of working on a lot of projects, but also the background. And then also, I think, um, as I said, like, I, I guess we have different talents. I definitely think um, Bing is a better people person, mm -hmm. although I feel pretty comfortable around people. And um, uh, and can schmooze when I have to. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, but um, but it's like a natural talent for him, you know, which is great. Um, and then for myself, I, I kind of deem myself like an all arounder. I'm like, I can detail, I can design, I can manage, I can schmooze, I can get commissions. I can, I'm like the level kind of, um, kind of, uh, what would I say? Someone able to uh project what the position that we want to be in and pitfalls that we may be encountering and i think bing does the same thing in different ways but mm -hmm. we have slightly varying kind of talents and we know each other enough to know okay this is you know without saying sometimes this is what needs to happen and you know since covid um, and so what happened to Bing was, um, you know, we're both working in New York. We started our office and unfortunately his father got ill, had cancer and was being treated in Japan and China back and forth. 
and he he went back to Shanghai to take care of his uh, family. His father passed away, and so he's taking care of his mother. At the same time, we got very busy on a couple projects. And since our one museum, the Mushing Art Museum, became a, a big success, um, by um, it was a big success uh, because of many factors. One, because of the project, but also because of the the single artist that it was for who was becoming um, quite famous. And then the director, which is a household name, who was right. the, art, the, the disciple. So, And then the location was also very famous in China. It just put our name on the map. And we started getting bigger and better inquiries from um, institutions and corporations. Um, so that kind of led to something. But that in that way, he... He would go back and forth from China to here, and I would be traveling to the Middle East and Japan. So we were kind of bumping into each other in the U.S. or in China, sometimes in Japan. Mm -hmm. But um, after COVID, you know, I stopped traveling pretty much to I stopped traveling for a year and a half. And then, I, you know, slowly, but I haven't been to China in two and a half years. And so, um, you know, we talked to each other pretty much once a day or once every couple of days, but it's almost at a point where our practice is mature that I already know um, we don't have to say so much to understand what's going on. And that's, that's something um, that I appreciate as well as you grow into the, the trust and the, the actual comfort mm -hmm. of working with someone and working with a partner. I mean, we have our differences and different opinions, but also that trust goes a long way. And you may not have, everyone has their own opinions, um, yeah. but the trust of not only your partner, but your fellow collaborators and your employees is very important, I think. So, yeah. Amazing. Brilliant. I think that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation there. Um, Hiroshi, thank you so much for... Ryan, thank you. Really and my apologies enjoyed. for the technical difficulties at the beginning, but I hope um, it was fun and it was a pleasure talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Take care. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.